Our Bible reading this evening comes from Luke's Gospel, chapter 18, and you'll find that on page 1052 of the Church Bibles. Jesus has been talking to the Pharisees and the disciples about the coming of God's kingdom and what that means for us from then until the day of the Son of Man when Christ will return. Luke chapter 18, and I'm starting to read at the first verse. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. And the Lord says, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, John, for that reading. Let's uh, pray as we uh, look at God's word this this evening. Father, I pray you take my words and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire for you. And Lord, I particularly pray in this area of prayer that you would speak to us tonight, and particularly as we look at the area of praying hard and praying through. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Then Jesus told his disciples, um, I don't need this at the moment, so... Let's keep that, uh, I'll come to that in a minute, Tim, thanks. Uh, Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. I want to start by giving you a simple example of perseverance, which happened today. I've been looking, oh dear, I keep losing my mic, let me get this fixed. I've been looking, suddenly realised that we are booked um, to go to Yorkshire tonight. So if you see me disappear a little bit um, as soon as this sermon's over, you'll know why. And please excuse me, as it's an over four-hour journey to Yorkshire. But we weren't going to Yorkshire until two and a half hours ago. Because yesterday... As you all know, the petrol crisis suddenly emerged in our world. And I went out yesterday evening thinking, I'll get enough petrol for Yorkshire. No petrol anywhere. (laughs) And queues, um, well, there weren't queues yesterday. Then this morning, very early, I went out thinking, I'll beat the rush. (laughs) I'll get, find a petrol station that has petrol. And for me, anyway, I didn't find a place um, not without a very long queue, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and and that was it. So I said to Pam, "Let's go out this afternoon and let's escape Watford because the message was there was no petrol in Watford." So we went out to Buckinghamshire. We went to my hometown, and I thought we'll go to the SO petrol station there. No petrol. Then we went two miles up the road to Joe's Cross. No petrol. So we thought that's it. We prayed. We've um, done all we can. We started the way back to Watford, but we went via Rickmansworth. And um, Pam had already phoned her mum to say, sadly, we can't come. The reason we're going to Yorkshire is my mother-in-law has sadly just literally last week lost her sister, and she was uh, last couple of weeks having to tend uh, her and everything. We just wanted to go and spend a few days with her to give her some support. But anyway, long story short, 
as we were going through Whitmansworth, along that road going to Watford, there were three petrol stations, and one of them, the first one, the BP, was in action. Packed, but in action. So we joined the queue, fortunately the right-hand queue, and got in fairly quickly and um, got enough petrol to go to Yorkshire and probably to come back from Yorkshire as well. I guess that was a bit of an example of perseverance. I want to also quote an example of somebody who had an experience of praying hard. And this was a church member in my first church uh, when I was a curate at St John's Woodley. And I was chatting with this uh, lady and she said, I, was, I went to a prayer meeting in Central Reading, she said, and it was the most hardest work I'd ever done. We, we basically prayed for about two to three hours and, and it was really hard work, she said. And I came out <coughs> totally exhausted. And sometimes we forget that prayer is hard work. In fact, I believe that actually the, it's the intensity and depth and not necessarily length of our prayers, but <coughs> our prayers make a difference it's it's that's the work not just say a meeting or whatever the uh, the work is done in our prayers but i also want to give you an example of a, a renewal meeting i attended many years ago probably 10 15 years ago and it was at st andrew's clevedon i think it was at their church hall not sure, I don't think it was their church, but we went there and we had, in Bath and Wells, we had, every year, we had a series of meetings. Sorry, this is probably about 20 years ago, actually. We had series of meetings. Um, we had one guest speaker for the whole week. And the Bath and Wells diocese is huge. And so we had five venues, four or five venues, that this speaker we would take round in the week, all over Somerset. So we might start in the north and we'd have some uh, venue in Yeovil and somebody in Western Supermare and so on. Uh, and um, when I was in Western Supermare, we hosted uh, a number of times this event. Anyway, this was in Clevedon. And uh, I can't remember who the speaker was that night, but they made a, a call, an altar call. They asked if somebody would if anyone here would like to give their lives to Jesus, and a man came forward and gave his life to Jesus. And um, his wife also came forward and testified that she'd been praying for her husband for 31 years. And they get, he'd, that moment, given his life to Christ. She'd been seeking for that to happen. That is perseverance in prayer, isn't it? <laughs> You're really persevering. Let's look at this reading that we heard that John read from uh, Luke 18. For me, this is one of the most powerful uh, parables uh, of Jesus and particularly on prayer. And basically, uh, the first bit really tells us what the parable is about. He told this parable that they should always pray and not give up, or never give up. And um, if you look at the Greek there, it basically means this. You should pray and never give up. It's that simple. That's what the Greek means. That's what they've translated, and that's what it means. But the thing... <coughs> but the, the trouble is, we need to be honest. Sometimes we pray, and we do give up. We stop praying. But things that you know God wants, and perhaps as you prayed along the way, there are clear signs from God that it's going to happen. I remember uh, an example um, that's told in the Alpha Course, so you may, may go, oh yes, I know about that, about uh, a, a mother who was praying for her son, and she got this vision of Jesus, uh, and Jesus gave her this vision of her son, coming to Christ 
And nine years later, he came to Jesus. And um, those who've done Alpha will know it's St. Augustine, who is obviously one of the leading theologians of the, the church in any century, let alone uh, the fourth, fifth century. Um, but sometimes we need encouragement from God to keep going. But the call is to keep praying. But how do we pray over a long period of time and not get exhausted? Well, the story is this parable is about a woman who needed justice. And probably the implications is that this judge is corrupt. He didn't care about God or men. And the woman was not just a woman, she was a widow. And to be honest, women didn't have a high status in that society, but even less of a status if they were a widow. And she almost certainly didn't have the money. The implication is all she had was this, this persevering spirit of keep knocking on his door saying, give me justice. And she, had, she obviously wasn't a wealthy woman, so she could bribe him. But he gave in basically because she persevered. And the message comes through loud and clearly from this parable. If we go on to um, verse 6, it's firstly this. God is not like that wicked judge. He is just and he longs to answer our prayers. But sometimes we have to wait. And waiting is difficult especially in our instant world. Sometimes it will be a long time for him to work out his providence in this fallen world. Sometimes, as Mark was saying on, uh, on, uh, on the video, sometimes we pray and we pray and perhaps we don't see what we've been praying for happen. Perhaps it doesn't happen as we prayed. So God longs to answer genuine requests, requests that really start with him. But perseverance is required. And secondly, there's a challenge. However, he says, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Will we be trusting people, longing for his kingdom, for his will be done, even if we don't actually see it while we're on earth? Or will we have given up? Because many do. Many give up on prayer. Even, sadly, tragically, their faith. Because they don't see instant prayer. They don't see quick, even medium-term answers to problems they face in their lives or in the life of a loved one, and so on. But we need to remember a number of things about seeing answers to our prayer. Firstly, it has to be from God. It's got to be in line with the will of God. Secondly, we need to be, if we're going to persevere in prayer for something, we need to be people who ask questions, not of others, but of God. How sometimes we need to ask, Lord, do we pray for this? How? Thirdly, we need to ask signs to keep us going, that this is really what you want us to do. Fourthly, we need to include and allow others to be part of our of prayer. And fifthly, as was mentioned on the uh, DVD, we need to pray and act. And I'll come back to that uh, in a moment. And we need to use scripture. Luke 11 uh, has the uh, verses 1 to 13, has the story of perseverance. The friend at midnight, he knocks on the door and the friend eventually gives him some some loaves. And the same with Elijah, isn't it? In the uh, video, seven times the servant went up 
and on the seventh time they saw the cloud. I want to finish by going on now to the DVD, if we can. I mean the PowerPoint even, sorry Tim. <laughs> the PowerPoint, that's what I meant, sorry. Thank you, brilliant. This is our last church, my last church, and St. Saviour's has been around since 1832, and uh, it was a Bath uh, town church, massive church. They built a huge church for us. Unfortunately, it was full of crumbling stone, which didn't help. Uh, I hope this doesn't crumble. Um, I'm positive this will last at least a hundred years before it crumbles. So let's, uh, let's. Uh, unfortunately, we were a lot, uh, many years into its life, and so it was quite a challenge. But one of the things that it needed desperately inside was renovation, was change. And in 2001, we had permission, we had a faculty and everything to put children's rooms in the back of the church and to, to transform the worship area, to put chairs rather than pews and underfloor heating because it was a very cold church, had massive high ceilings, much higher even than these, and so on and so on. And we raised enough money to do the project at the back, on the, on the sort of toward the back of the church, and to do the church itself. But the one thing we wanted to do was to do this, what we would call, let's just call it for now, the children's rooms. And they were going to be a, a sort of three-story building at the back of our church, which we could do because we had such a high ceiling. You could build three stories inside this grey star listed building. We had a faculty for this. Now, to cut a long story short, we had crumbling parapets. And clum, clum, that cost us £200,000. And together, for, with various other reasons, we basically did the first part of the project and we stopped. And then in 2009, we looked again at whether we ought to do the children's rooms at the back or whether we had a bit of land outside, but um, whether we ought to build a hall outside. Now, I want to let you into a secret, and you might know what this is. The Bath planners, the planning authorities in Bath, if you build something outside, you have to go and ask them, have one word for virtually any proposal that you ask in Bath. Can anybody think what it is? Yes, Mary. No, that's it. Exactly. And we sort of tentatively asked them about building this building. And they tentatively sort of said, perhaps. And a number of us, were, we sort of did a li some little plans, not nothing, didn't spend a huge amount of money or anything on it. Anyway, we came to a PCC, and a number of us were quite positive about building perhaps outside, or at least thinking about building outside. But lo and behold, when we all prayed about it, the PCC, virtually a whole lot of us changed our minds and decided that we would build inside. So we went back to look at our plans and our faculty in 2009. And the first thing we had to do, because some of our needs had changed, some of the, uh, we had to get a new architect for a start, uh, and so on, because our, sadly our architect had retired by the time we got, got there, which was a, a shame. Anyway, cut a long story short, we went back to the Chancellor, and I'll let you into a little secret. He could have told us that we needed a completely new faculty, because the Church of England faculty system had changed. Although we'd renewed our faculty, um, the system itself had changed, but he, he, proposed, he sent the, we wrote to him and he said to the DAC that they weren't to think about a whole new faculty, they were just to literally look at any proposed changes. And lo and behold, in, I think it was by now, it was 2010, we got our faculty. But that began years of struggle. We knew we had an assessment and 
they reckoned it was going to cost us about half a million to do this. And we tried to raise some money and we got about 60,000 with perhaps 100,000 pledged, but that sort of drifted away. Some of it came in. And it was just very, very difficult. And so we had years of struggle. This was what we were proposing to do. We got three floors. We had the downstairs floor, but that was going to be completely renewed. And then we were going to build uh, three rooms on the second level. It doesn't look so clear. And then a wonderful top uh, youth room at the top. So that was the plan. That was the, what we put in our brochure, so to speak, eventually, when we went back to the congregation. And we tried the congregation, and it basically... The PCC, I have to say, decided it was too much money and they weren't very keen on this. But they wouldn't tell the rector that, really. They just decided that um, uh, they'd, they'd go along and just see him not make, get the money. That was really the truth, if I was honest. So we, it came to mind that there were some people on the PCC who were keen. In fact, four of us. And we could have been called if we'd been, um, uh, if we'd been in China, the Gang of Four. <laughs> but that probably isn't fair because we weren't like that. But we met together when we were just struggling. We couldn't seem to get anywhere. And we met and we prayed. And every time we met, we just felt this energy from God that this was what God wanted us to do. Alongside this, there were a number of other things, providential meetings with a, um, a, a businessman in, um, uh, in, in Bath when I was um, actually acting as the mayor's chaplain, and he ran a trust um, that gave money to good causes and particularly to young people's causes and to churches as well. And um, eventually we... Um, he gifted £50,000 towards this uh, project. Also, as we moved along, we got to a point where we just seemed to be going nowhere as a church. So I asked my good friend, who is our mission advisor, Keith Powell, to come and uh, see if he had any wisdom to give us why we weren't sort of moving forward as a church. And Keith came, he said, well, I've been praying about this and I've got this obscure verse from the Old Testament from Deuteronomy 10, verse 4. And basically it says to, that Moses was to go and represent, represent the um, Ten Commandments. And Keith said, do you think, does that make any sense to you? And I said, well, not really. Not quite sure what it means at all. Um, and... Um, so we prayed a bit more, and he said to me, is there anything that you feel God had wanted you to do, or the church to do, that it hasn't done? And I said, well, over here, I pointed over here, here were all the plans for the project. And he said, well, show me them. So I showed him and explained the plans, and he said, well, this is what God wants you to do. You need to represent it. So from that point on, and he also gave us a bit of advice about how to deal with the PCC. And that was not to get a whip, you'll be glad to know, not to imprison them or torture them in any way, but to declare before a PCC meeting three days of prayer and fasting, which a lot of our church members took seriously. And I remember the third day we actually gathered together in prayer in the evening and there were an awful lot of gurgling stomachs which sounded like they'd taken the fasting very seriously indeed. Anyway, cut a long story short, for the first time we went back. One of the things this businessman had asked us to do was to come with a business plan for this project and um, also to reassess the costs, etc., etc., which we did. And we put the business plan to the PCC, and to our shock, they agreed it unanimously. Not only that, we then decided to go back to the church. So we went back to the church, and the church promised another, um, some, pledged another 
uh, about £150,000 this time. We had the £50,000 from uh, a guy called David Medlock, and we had various other grants. And we got to around £250,000, £260,000. Now, you have to understand that we'd been, um, we had a, um, a, quant a, a, a QE, an a, a engineer, a quantity engineer. I'm not I'm saying that right. What do I mean? Quantity surveyor who basically said, um, a QS, that's right, a quantity surveyor who basically gave us a, an estimate of about 500,000, and that was in 2009, and this is now 2015. Anyway, <clears throat> we got to a point where we had a lot of, lot of money pledged, but not quite enough to do anything particularly. But we still didn't really know how much it would cost us. So I, I chatted with a church warden. This is where God sometimes speaks through others when you're persevering with a big prayer challenge. And I said to John, who was a former church warden, he was actually the church warden when I first came to the church, and I, he said, what's happening? How, how's the project going? And I said, well, it's in a bit of a, a messy business at the moment. We haven't quite got enough money, but we've made great strides but we're not, do, we're not going anywhere. And he said this, far the starting gun. And this is where Mark's step of faith came in. So we went to the PCC, I went to the PCC and I said, we've got 250,000, we have over 60,000 pounds in the kitty, let's splash 25,000 of that and go out to tender and see how much it is. And you might go, oh, but that was our step of faith. That was the step of faith that we ha sometimes you have to do when you're called to do something by God. And so we took that step of faith. And all through the summer, we prayed. And I remember having prayer meetings in, a, in a, uh, our former another former church warden's house who lived just up from the church, a lady called Jean Hopkins. And Jean um, wasn't a well lady at the time, unfortunately, sadly. Um, but she ha offered her house for a prayer meeting, and we met regularly over that summer, praying for the project, persevering in prayer. Anyway, the good news was in October, the tenders came back, the architect did all his preparations, sent it out to tender, and the, basically the quotes came in far lower than we expected for the whole project, 400 plus thousand rather than 500, 550, even 600 some people were expecting. And so then we um, were helped by another person who got to work and we discussed the bill and we got the first phase which would have been the first two sections we were able to do for about 320, 330,000 let's say that. So we went back to the PCC and said, well, we've got 250, Let, let's go for this first one. And they said, well, where are we going to find the money? So I said, let's go back to the congregation. They've given so much. Um, let's see if they give again. And they did. They gave two weeks before Christmas. They gave at St. Saviour's Church a Christmas present. They coughed up uh, literally another 70, 80,000 pounds. And we had the t 330. But lo and behold, above that, that meant that we could do, this is just, that's a picture when we started the project. So this was January 2016, and this was the church absolutely stripped, and we'd actually, at the back, already taken out some pews and done it ourselves to save a bit of money. And um, it was all ready for the builder to come. And I just want to to show you. This is a new servery we built in the downstairs, which was a beautiful servery and served coffee and we had a, a coffee sort of shop, a uh, fair trade coffee shop that, where it was served on a Friday morning and they did day club meals from it and so on. But the one thing we didn't have enough money was for this upper room, which was glazed so you could see out onto the whole church. You could see the rear dos we had there and the communion table and this was our prayer room and our youth room 
Lydia, you would have loved it for if you'd done youth up there or children. You, the children had the one below, actually, but the youth were up there. But um, we didn't have enough money for this. But I said to the builder, we will have enough money. So be prepared, you know, when's the last moment we can actually do that part of the room uh, in, uh, in the sort of time scale of the project? Because they promised to be finished by September. They started in January, we're going to finish in September. And he said the end of April. And lo and behold, that money came in. And uh, I won't go through, but somebody, one of our, our fundraiser who was applying to trust, actually thought she'd applied to this trust and found she didn't, hadn't, because it was a very similar name. And so, for various reasons, we applied to a trust, and they came and um, saw us uh, in February, um, and they had a meeting of their trustees, and we were 50,000 short to do this by this time. And <clears throat> they gave us 25,000. The person who I mentioned, um, who wasn't uh, sadly very well, um, she sadly died in the March before, sadly, the project actually happened. But she left us 20,000 pounds. So we had um, 45,000 of it. But we needed, actually, to complete that room, 51. So I did something cheeky. <laughs> Somebody, one of our congregation members said they were very, really passionate that we had a servery, and that cost us 6,000 pounds. So I, I said to them, would you consider giving us 5,000 pounds plus the tax to pay for that <laughs> servery? Now, this, this is somebody who wasn't totally short of money. You'll, you'll be glad to know. Well, that might be an unfair. But um, when I, uh, they did indicate they might do that. So it wasn't a total out of the blue. You know? <laughs> so it's all right, folks. I won't, won't be coming to us. But um, uh, this, I, I, I asked them whether they consider that. I said, I know it's very cheeky. And I asked them. And they replied, not no, but they said, um, I'll just uh, I'll have a look at my finances and get back to you. Anyway, they then replied, the money's in the account. So they gave for that, which released another 6,000 to pay for the upper room. And in September 2016, we had the project completed. And that is a photo actually of the development. And although you can't see it very clearly, the upper room is actually there. But because it's all glass, it doesn't look like it's there, but it is. Um, and if I go back to that, that's looking that way. And sadly, in the photograph, I didn't have any lights on, so it doesn't shine out. But that's what well, so I tell you, the glass costs an awful lot of money, about 40,000. But anyway, that's what you have to do for a grade two star listed building. But um, if you have a very forward-looking chancellor, you're OK. But that was just an example of, um, I, I thought I'd share with you, because it was an example of real perseverance. And sometimes, with God, we just have to persevere. And I just want to finish with Mark's quote that he said at the end, because I think it is so important. He said, the greatest tra tragedy is not unanswered prayer, but unasked prayer. Interesting thought to leave us with. But can I encourage you this evening, there may be things that you have been praying for, perhaps for this church, perhaps for your family, whatever it is that you haven't seen come into being yet. And I'd like to encourage you, keep going. Think of that lady She'd been praying for her husband for 31 years, and he came to faith. May we see prayers answered, even if it takes years to come about. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.